this is A. M. Nicholson, the Minister of Social Welfare for Saskatchewan in uh, Nays Motel in North Battleford, um, visiting with Mr. Cameron Ross McIntosh on uh, the second day of August, 1963. Mr. McIntosh uh, tells me that he was born in Dornock, Grey County, Ontario, on the 7th of July, 1871. This, Mr. McIntosh, will mean that you are more than 90 years old, uh, and uh, this is remarkable that you're in such good health. I have a very special interest in Mr. McIntosh. Uh, he uh, taught in uh, Athens, Ontario, where my wife was born. Uh, he and my father-in-law were both teaching there at the, sa at the same time. Uh, Mr. McIntosh came west, and in due course, Mr. Massey uh, was following the exam example of many people and uh, came along west, too. So, um, to begin with, Mr. McIntosh, we would like you to uh, uh, tell us something about your earliest recollections of your boyhood days in Ontario. Well, uh, Mr. Nickerson, I was born near a little village called Darna. You have, ha you made note of that. And uh, the McIntoshes came from Glengarry in 1842 to the Queen's Bush in Western Ontario, which was made up of Gray, Bruce, and Europe. And we, the McIntosh family, were the first settlers in the Dornoff area in 1842. Did uh, the McIntoshes speak Gaelic? Uh, the, both mother and father spoke Gaelic, but they're from different shires, and, and they didn't use it very much in the home, and they didn't teach it to their children. Oh, that's a great pity. I had the same experience. Yeah. Uh, my father and mother both yeah. spoke it, but uh, my mother died when I was young, and I didn't have the experience. How far would you have to go to school? Well, we, there was there were two schools. There was one south and one north. Mm -hmm. We went the uh, town line between uh, the town line between four townships: Glenelg, Bentic, Holland, and Sullivan. At their junction, this village of, of Dorf started. And one school went, as I said, south and another north, and we went to the south school. We called the brick, the red brick school. Oh, yes. How many in your family? Uh, well, there would be, uh, there were uh, three boys and uh, three girls. And how far would you have to walk to school? Oh, about uh, a little over a mile. I see. A little over a mile. Where were you in the family? You were the... I was the, uh, I would be the uh, fourth in the family. Oh, yes. And was it uh, much of a problem provide a good education? Uh, well, we, we had, I was fortunate. The first teacher I went to was uh, Alexander Lettingham. Now, the Lettinghams are a very important family in, in Greek County. And uh, there were four or five families of the Lettinghams. And this Le Lettingham was the son of uh, Mr. and Mrs. George Lettingham. And he was our first teacher. And uh, later, later he went into the ministry, became a Presbyterian minister, and went to in India and served in the Biddle tribe. Come back home, died in Canada, and he's buried in Vancouver. Nice. Uh, 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 a beloved teacher. There was a Dr. Lettingham in charge of the National Research uh, Established. This, would be a this is a cousin. This oh, is a cousin. Oh, yes. Uh, now, he was your teacher. Uh, yes. Before he went to India. Yes. Oh yes, and he came out west and homesteaded near Moonstjaw. Oh yes. And the and the the uh, big Presbyterian church in Moonstjaw, which is now a United Church, sent him to to India. Oh, I see. To his missionary field. And, and he's uh, over there for years. He opened up some new horizons to you. Well, the last time I saw him, he said, "Now, he, he, of course, he knew our family very well." We were in there first, and then he came in later on, and we all knew one another. We went to the same church, and and he was he was in our school, and I remember him telling he was home, I guess from the mission field at this time, and they had a they had a, a, a celebration for him, and we went to the manse, and I went, and when he said me goodbye, I said, now remember, Cameron, make the best of life. That was very good advice. Never forgot. It. Oh yes. And where would you go for your high school work? My high school work, I went to uh, 
I went to the Old Sound Collegiate Institute, one of the best institutes there in Ontario. It had, had a rec it had had a rec record which was only equaled by uh, uh, the the uh, collegiate in in London, and one in Toronto. Oh yes. And uh, F. W. Merchant, a red-headed principal, and a science man, was one of the best disciplinarians in Ontario, and he and he brought the collegiate up to a very high mark. I got my, my secondary school education there and in the Durham High School. How far would you be from Owen Sound? We're 20 miles from Owen Sound. And from Durham? 10 miles. You went Dur my Owen Sound was the bigger place. You went and, to, to uh, Durham first, though, did I you? I went to Durham first, yes. And then you uh, took some teacher's training where? Well, my teacher's trip. I t I after that, I taught three years in the home school, where Lillingham taught, in our home school, in the brick school. Oh, yes. And then I went in and got my second at the Collegiate Known Sound. I got it in six months, but some others were taking two years. Wow. And I taught out in Bruce County, north of Chester, for four years in a rural school. Now, they were the two rural schools I taught in. Well, you have some teacher's training in the meantime? Uh, uh, no, I, no, well, I, yes. I went, to the, I went to model you, school. You, or you had to qualify, qualify for teaching on a third or a second or, or, or a first. You'd get that in own sound. Well, right? I, no, I went to the Durham Model School for, oh, yes. for for to qualify for a third class certificate, and that's what. After I got that, I taught in the home school for three years. Oh yes. Well then, <coughs> that certificate was good enough for another four years in Bruce when I got my second. Oh yes. I didn't have to go to the model school again. I didn't go to the normal. No. But I went in then, got my first in another six months when others were taking two years at it. And when I got my first, I went to the uh, uh, Ontario, I went to the uh, normal school, uh, normal college in, in, in Hamilton. Oh yeah, that's the, that is the highest training then for university graduates and those with first class certificates in Ontario. Oh yes, my home was in Bruce County, and the Durham uh, oh, training yeah. school was the school that the people from around my home went to in those Where days. Where were you born well, there? I was, I was born at Lucknow in the southern part. Oh, yes, I know all that. Well, yeah. our people were settled. Uh, my mother's people were nearly all in Bruce. They were around Port Elgin. A lot of McDonald's and McDonald's well, person. The, uh, our relatives were the Smiths. Oh, yes. And Alex Smith was later liberal organizer for Laurier in Ontario. Oh, no. He was a lawyer and he, he lived in Ottawa. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you had finished your first class. Yes. Uh, when did you get down to Athens? Where well, uh, I went down to Athens in the year 1901, after I qualified at Hamilton. 1901? Yes, oh. after teaching uh, seven schools, seven years in the rural schools of Bruce and Gray. Oh, yes. I went down there to as principal of the Athens Model School uh, in 1901. 1901. Oh, yes. And, and you were one of the youngest principals of the model school then in Ontario. Oh, yes. And you'd be in Athens for how many years? Well, I was there for, I went there in 1901, I left in 1907. I to come west? Yes, to come west. But there's a very important thing about the teaching at Athens model school. A Athens was named Athens because of its, of its educational institutions. It's high school, and it's public school, and it's model school. It's called Athens. The old name was Farmersville. Yes. And they called it Athens because of its standing in, in uh, primary and uh, secondary education. Oh, yes. And <coughs> the school is fed from the surrounding villages and towns and counties. And uh, they had some of the best students there. I think I ever met in my life in one way or another. And when I went into the model school, of course, I had my own ideas. I didn't think I should teach the way I was taught in the model school myself, although I had a very fine te teacher in Durham, Mr. Allen, a splendid teacher. But I thought the students could get more out of the model course during the four months in the fall than I got. Sir. So I conceived the idea of running my model school entirely on the basis of public speaking. Well, um, I my method was this. I'd outline, I'd take school management or school law or psychology and I'd outline a chapter or two chapters on the blackboard and they were looking on all the class and then I would divide the chapter into five or six divisions and I'd ask five or six to take 
Take those divisions and be ready on the morrow or a certain date to stand up before the class and develop the theme of these three or four paragraphs and then be ready for questions from the class and, he, and as a teacher he could ask questions too. Now uh, that was the that was the method of, of I used in public speaking and used it for the four years and the the first year the, Mr. Tilly came around from Toronto he was the model school inspector for Ontario. He lived in Toronto, belonged to one of the leading families in Toronto, the Tillys. And uh, he came around and he looked around the school and he heard the students taking up the work in, in, in by this new method. And uh, he told me, now I can't put in a report on your school. I never saw this way done in this way before. I'm not sa satisfied that it's a success, it was going to be a success. So I can't put in a report to the board. But I'm coming around in another year or two and I'll know then better what to do. So he came around two years. Well, I sa said, Mr. Tilly, uh, first time he came around, I said, Mr. Tilly, I'm going down or up on this. It's either going to be a success or a complete failure. I think it'll be a success. I've got that hunch because I went through one model school and I know all the other model schools in Ontario are taught in the same way. And I'm not finding any fault with any principle or, or, or methods they use. They thought that they were using the best method possible. But now I'm going to try this on my own, on my own basis. I've got another idea. I think I think I think I can do better work uh, than if I use the common methods they used in the model schools of Ontario. So I decided in public speaking. He came around two years, <coughs> and he graded my school first in Ontario. And here's the I'll give you the report. Now here's the report in his own words. I had it written out in the office, but I forgot it. All the work done in this school was of a very high order in securing the development, in securing the individual development of his students, Mr. McIntosh has, Mr. McIntosh has, uh, what's this, <laughs> has achieved results which I've never before seen equaled in any school. Well, this is very interesting. Uh, now, that, 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 that report's in Toronto in the Department of Education, yes. Yes, I was just noting, this is more than 60 years ago, yeah. Mr. McIntosh. Uh, yeah. You were uh, just 30, well, just 30, 30 well, when you 30. went, uh, you were a very young principal well, to take, years, take well, on such uh, part responsibility. Yes. Well, Mr. McIntosh, we've just played back a bit of this, and uh, I believe you'd like to add uh, uh, two or three corrections uh, regarding your... Uh, the uh, Scottish families uh, in Ontario. Yes, uh, as I said, uh, my mother's people settled in Bruce C C County in the vicinity of uh, Port Elgin, and uh, relatives of my of, of the family there were the Smiths, the Bells, and the Camerons. The Bells were in the Hudson Bay Company. In the Hudson Bay Company, in early years. John Bell, a brother of my grandmother, on my mother's side, Susan Bell, came out with Sir, with Donald Smith. Both were 18 years of age when they came from Scotland. They went into the Hudson Bay Company and lived all, all their life trading with the Red Men across northern Canada. Uh, Donald Smith was af afterwards created, was, ma was known as Sir Donald Smith, and later as Lord Strathcona. He was uh, active in the building of the CPR. Well, he and John Bell went to come out together and worked together for years. Oh, I see. And uh, that's up and down the rivers and lakes of northern Canada, trading in furs with the Indians. And, and uh, Some of them lived in the Glengarry area. Well, that family all settled out in British Columbia. And I never met any of them until I became member, because in the early years there was no automobiles, and we're, we're living down in Ontario, and they were living out in B.C., and of course, we knew all of them, but we never saw them. After I became member, I went out, and I, I dug up the members of the family, and they're still out in uh, Victoria and Vancouver 
in the real estate, uh, bond, uh, and insurance business. The, the Pembertons were married into, uh, into the Bell family, and the name Pemberton in, 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 the, in the Pacific province is very, very well known. Oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you and my father-in-law were teaching in Athens at the same time. Mr. Massey, uh, you mentioned you were going to say something about your relationships with the... Yes, Nazis. I'm very glad you brought that up, uh, Mr. Nicholson. When I was teaching in Athens for six years, uh, Mr. Massey was principal of the high school during all the time I was there. And he had one of the uh, best uh, uh, setups in a secondary way, uh, as far as results were concerned, in Athens, <laughs> of any other, uh, of any school in the province. Mr. Massey, as I am stood him, was an outstanding mathematician. He taught mathematics, and he knew it from top to bottom. And what, what, what little success I had, quite likely in the model school, in, Athens was based on many of the pupils, students that he had trained in the secondary way when they came to the model school uh, to get a certificate to go out and make some money to win. This is A.M. Nicholson again um, interviewing uh, Mr. Cameron Ross McIntosh on the uh, second day of August 1963 in um, Nays Motel in North Battleford. We've uh, had a little recess where we've had dinner in the Auditorium Hotel. Mr. McIntosh uh, saw quite a number of his friends, uh, put among them uh, Mr. Roy Knight, former member of Parliament for Saskatoon, who came to uh, this North Country in 1912. He recalled a very interesting conversation he had with Mr. McIntosh. Uh, first year he was in the North Country, and um, we'll resume again. I think um, when we left off uh, uh, before supper, we had um, said something about your period in Athens, Ontario, Mr. McIntosh, and uh, you had moved from Athens to uh, Perth. Uh, would you uh, say something about your experience uh, at Perth? Yes, Mr. Nicholson, I left Athens in June 1907 and went to start in as principal of the Perth Public and Model School in September. I was there four years till 1911 when I came west to North Battleford. On, my, uh, on the Board of Education in Perth, which is the county town of Lanark, and one of the outstanding uh, counties in Ontario because it, it does all, this, all its own financing. And therefore, uh, the administration of the whole county is carried on in a way very efficiently. Uh, that's a reminder that the people living in the Perth area are mostly of Scottish descent and they haven't forgotten the lesson they learned in finance in Old Scotland. Very good, yes. Now, uh, I, left, uh, I had on my boat, uh, Board of Education in Perth. <coughs> the, uh, all the schools are represented on this Board of Education, the public school, the model school, and the high school. And it had one of the best boards of education, I think, perhaps in the province. Uh, on the school board were, were the Mean family very, very well represented. Uh, apparently, most of the Means had settled in Perth. Uh, the uh, branch of the, uh, of the Honorable Arthur Means family settled in St. Mary's, Ontario. But the other Means were mostly in Perth. Uh, uh, one family, from what I remember, went to Montreal. And uh, we had on the school board in Perth, as I said, we had Dr. Meehan. We had uh, uh, one, of the oldest, uh, one of the oldest members of the school board in Perth, Charles Meehan, and we had uh, W.A. Meehan, who was at the head of the uh, Meehan Departmental Store in Perth. They would be uncles uh, or cousins? Yes, of Honorable all co uncles and cousins of Honorable Arthur Meehan, and they were mm -hmm. all outstanding conservatives, Mr. Nicholson. 
and one of the very finest families in a political way that any for any man could meet. Oh, I'll tell you a story. Yes. When I was leaving Paris, I was walking down the main street and I met Jack Stewart. Jack Stewart was after, afterwards member, MP for Atlanta County at Ottawa. And he was in, if I remember correctly, he was in Arthur Means' cabinet. And um, he's gone now, but he was a lawyer in Perth when I was there. And he met me on the street and he stopped me. He says, Mac, I hear you're going west. Yes, I said, Jack, I think I better go west. My mother's people are out there. The early years in Hudson Bay, uh, uh, me, I think I've taught school long enough. Uh, I, I'm leaving. I'm leaving right away. Well, he says, look, if you don't want to leave, he says, let me know, and you can stay in Perth as long as you wish. Well, that is a very fine party message. From an outstanding conservative, and I've gone into the 1908 election and helped the liberal candidate in that area. And he knew about it, and this is this this is his parting shot at me. Oh, now yeah. I'll leave it to any i leave it to any person. You could find a find a finer spirit of cooperation and decency than that. Oh well, that's very interesting. We'll come back to uh, yeah. your associations with the Honorable Arthur meeting, me and when you're both in yeah. the House of Commons. Yeah. But before we move west. Uh, you were going to say a word about teacher salaries on Ontario. What was your uh, first salary and something about the other salaries? In the old brick school, I got $250 a year in 1892, $275 in 1893, $300 in 1894. Then I went back to get my second in own I went out to Bruce County, as we said before, and I taught four years outside of Chesley, Ontario, in number six. Rural school. I got three hundred and seventy-five dollars there for the first year, and four hundred dollars for the next three years. I went in, and got my first, went to the Norman College, as I said, in, in Hamilton, and then went down to Athens as a principal of school, and got, if I remember correctly, five hundred dollars for being principal of the Athens Public and Model School for, for the first year, eighteen ni eighteen ninety-one to eighteen ninety-two. What did you do with all the money? <coughs> I spent it in school books. And took up a university course and finished it in 1908, and I was teaching in Perth. You would take a correspondence yeah, course, course with correspondence from Queens? Yes. Oh, yes. I had my first year in the university when I got my first, you see, and all yes. I had to do was finish the other three, the three years, and I taught and finished it, and then King West. And when I came West, I had my university And university what would you degree. be paying for board in those days? Oh, I boarded the hotel in Perth that seems to Seems to me I got a Reuben board for, uh, seems to me it was 12 or 15 dollars a month right. for the room. Yes. And then separate for the uh, meals. And when you were teaching for 300 in uh, Bruce County? Uh, uh, at, at, when I got 400. 400. Uh, I boarded with a man by the name of McDonald. And uh, he was a fireman. And they called him Yankee McDonald. And he came from the States. And he was a Methodist. And uh, he was Reeve of. Eldersley Township for about 20 years. He was beaten, beaten, beaten once, and the only way to beat him was a, no, no man but even my doll ramming it against him, and they got the two names mixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll turn back to Gray County again, and uh, you have a bit more information uh, uh, to uh, add to this uh, part of the past. Yes, uh, Mr. Nicholson, I might say that although our family lived in Greek County, I, I, I mentioned, mentioned how most of my, my mother's people were in Bruce County, but uh, there's one incident about my father. He was in Bruce County, and he and another man came down the Saugeen River by raft from Bruce County to Gray County. And further, when our people came from Glengarry into Gray County in 1842, my father, the, there was no no road, the main highway into the Queen's Bush then, and Gray County was one of the counties in the Queen's Bush, and Bruce and Huron were the other two. There was no artery of trade or commerce to open up the county of Gray. So a road was built from Fergus to Own Sound, about 60 miles. And my father helped to chop the road. It was called the Gary Road, from Dora 
where our people live, they go on south and 30 miles distant. That seems better. Right well, Mr. McIntosh, uh, we'll go back to Perth, where we uh, left off, and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll move from Perth to Saskatchewan. Will you tell us a bit about uh, how you happened to, to uh, leave, uh, leave Perth in spite of the uh, advice of good friends like the Means when the pull for the West was uh, so strong? Well, Mr. Nicholson, one of the main reasons why I left the East to come West was that the salaries paid to teachers in those days were very really disappointing. The best, best teachers got practically nothing compared to what they're doing now. The result was that many hundreds and even thousands of the best teachers in Ontario left teaching and went into other professions or into business. Uh, that is one reason why, that is one reason why I left Perth. Another reason was that from boyhood, from my early man, from when I started to teach in Gray County, I wrote. I was a correspondent for our district to the old Durham Review. The Durham Review is now out of existence, and there's one paper in Durham by the name of the Durham Chronicle. We take it in our office, but the old review has gone out of business. The Chatsworth News has gone out of business. I wrote for the two of them, mainly for the Durham Review. and. I got the urge for writing by being a correspondent in my boyhood days for the Durham Review that I visited quite often and knew the, uh, knew the publisher, Mr. Ramage, who was an ex-school teacher in the Durham area. These were two of the reasons why I left, and another reason then was that the average teacher, whether in high school, all, all, uh, all high school teachers of their living today could testify that even in the high school area in Ontario, as well as in rural, rural public school areas and uh, villages and small towns, the teacher had no standing. He was kicked or she was kicked from pillar to post. If they didn't, li uh, if, they, if they didn't board in the right pl place, uh, trustees and people in the district would find fault with them. And the teacher had no independence, no freedom, and it's no wonder the teachers left by the thousands to go into other professions because they stood it as long as they could. And, uh, of course, the inevitable took place. The big change took place. And um, as a result... I gather that uh, when you were offered this school, when you were 31, as uh, a teacher to teach teachers, you must have had quite a fare for teaching. Uh, I presume uh, you found teaching very rewarding, and if, teacher, if the teachers had the sort of prestige they now have, you probably would have spent your life in the teaching profession. Yes, that's right, Mr. Nicholson. There was another reason why I left the teaching profession. They had no unions of their own. They've gotten unions since. And, and they negotiate with trustee boards. They negotiate with, with uh, members of other provinces. They, they have their own legal advisor. And they know where they're at, and they've got a standing that teachers never had when I was teaching. And the great support of the unions, the unions may have had some faults, but from the standpoint of the teachers, they had a lot of good qualities. It helped to put the teaching profession on a solid basis. Yes. The uh, uh, principal of the Perth School didn't have the standing that the owner of the local hotel probably had in those days. Oh, that's about the size of it. No. Yes, and... Uh, so it went all in that way. Oh, yes. So you uh, applied to uh, North Battleford, and you uh, school yeah. lined up before you left well, I, Perth? I, I, was, I, I, got, I was appointed principal before I left Perth, and I came here. In what year would that be? 1911. 1911. I taught in North Battleford for four or five months. And my mind was on the uh, journalism, and uh, meanwhile I negotiated with Mr. Bodden, who owned the news, oh, yes. and uh, really bargained with him in 1911 and took, pos took possession of the news in March 1912. Had you any thought of a political career at this time with a view to uh, changing conditions? No, I it? don't think I had, although members of my family said that they thought I had. That uh, I went into the uh, field of journalism journalism because I heard in the East how, how uh, 
Members of the daily and weekly press in Western Canada were thought a great deal of and, and filled an important niche in the development of Western Canada. But I didn't bother much about that. However, the minute I got into, minute I got into journalism, uh, I think I made, uh, I think, uh, I, I started in the right way. I not only paid attention to the city of North Battleford in regard to business and in regard to news, in regard to editorial work and so forth, I went out into the North Country and met the farmers, met the businessmen, got acquainted with them, wrote up every district, and above and beyond all, made the statement, and I think I was the first to make it in, in, Ca in Western Canada or in Eastern Canada, that the Northland was where our future would have to be as a nation. And if that were true, the Northland, if that were true, the Northland, as far as North Valley was concerned, was its future. And so uh, I stressed that for years. How long, would, how long would you be here before you uh, became so enthusiastic about the potential of the North Country? Oh, uh, almost immediately, because my, pa my mother's feet had been in the North Country all across, and the rivers and lakes. And uh, I used to hear my mother talk about it, about the Bales and the Smiths. And uh, the, the bailer came out with Donald Smith and made their, uh, made, uh, they all made their mark in the Hudson Bay Company. And that was way back er, er, before I was born. But I heard my mother speaking about it. And, and of course, my father came west and homesteaded out of Regina in, in, eight, in, in 1882 and, and spent seven years in the west. Oh. And then came back home to Ontario because he wouldn't take the family out on account of the educational facilities being so poor, so poor at that time. Oh, that's very interesting. He yeah. was here and proved up in a homestead yes. uh, before you came. At Avonhurst in, uh, in Saskatchewan, out from Regina. Oh, yes. You and I have a poem on that called The Avonhurst Pioneer. Oh. Do you, you don't remember it offhand? No, I don't remember it. No, it'll be but in my book be, of poems, though. Oh, yes. Well, at this point, you might say a word about your book of poems. I am uh, glad to have uh, been able to, uh, to place an advanced copy for... Uh, <laughs> For an investment of four yes, dollars, uh, uh, will you say a word about your uh, uh, your poems? Yes, thanks, Mr. Nicholson. You're the first member of the provincial cabinet that's given me a uh, 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 given me a uh, place in order for uh, an order for uh, my book of poems. I might say I just started a few weeks ago to contact a few people in order to find out about how many we would have to run off. It's a big job, it's a costly job, and of course we don't want to run off a thousand or two thousand or three thousand and have a, a thousand traps left on our hands. So I can see that idea of getting in touch with the public and getting in touch with public mail and getting in touch with boards and, and councils and districts in one way or another to, to find out in a small way and in some way how many we should run off, and uh, we have about perhaps uh, 15 or 20 orders in already. Oh, yes. And they're coming in gradually. And, uh, well, this is very... Uh, I might I say the volume of poems will consist of about 300. They've been written in the last 20 years, since 1940. Some are written when I was a member, not very many. Some are written when I was teaching, not very many. The most in the last 20 years. And they're thoroughly Canadian, Mr. Nicholson. Some are on, some are, some are uh, obituary, some are sacred, some uh, 20 or 30 on Canada, 15 or 20 on Saskatchewan. In fact, all Canada is covered quite well from sea to sea. Some of them were written after you turned 90? Yes, I've written. I've written uh, a half a dozen or more. I've written two or three poems in the last in the last six months. Oh yeah. Yes, uh, from one Scott to another, we could make mention of the uh, price of the volume, uh, Mr. Bankendosh. The uh, volume will cost four dollars, Mr. Nicholson, and it'll be produced, I think, in our own office. Perhaps not, but. but it likely will. Oh, I hope it'll, it'll be bound outside of our own office. I hope, and it'll, it'll be beautifully gotten. Up. It'll be a souvenir for any person who buys it. I hope it'll be produced in North Battleford. Yeah. Uh, the uh, this will add a good deal to uh, its value. It's uh, printed uh, in Saskatchewan and in yeah. North Battle. Well, Mr. McIntosh, we uh, we got you to uh, North Battleford and into the uh, printing and publishing business and. Uh, you mentioned that you were 
not only became enthusiastic about the possibility of the future of this city, but of the whole North Country. And I wonder if you develop that a little further to indicate something of the... Um, yes, Mr. Nixon. I came to North Battle in 1911 from conversations I had with people living in the city, <coughs> in the town it was then, and later on in the country. Many of, the, many of them wondered whether North Battle would ever amount to anything or not. Well, of course, I was young, and a young, young as a citizen. I wasn't very long in the, in the town. But I sized up the proposition from the standpoint of the, of the hinterland of North ba Battle. I considered it was in one of the best areas in Western Canada, which has since proven correct. And that uh, is wonderful North back route that uh, would make the city uh, an important distribution and transportation system in the future. That's turned out fairly well, although the railway system has broken down. Our air system at the present time is to a certain extent broken down too, but we figure that both will come back. However, the city has grown. It's now around 12 to 13,000 without considering the <coughs> 2,000 or more across the river. And everything has gone forward very splendidly and very hopefully. But we were the last, Mr. Nicholson, to develop. I wonder how many people in Saskatchewan have thought about our northern areas, that Problems were started down south by the CPR. The CPR did not accept the survey, which was made by Sir Stanford Fleming in the early years. It, it threw it overboard and got frightened of the Jim Hill lines in, uh, in the United States. And the result was, in Montreal, one night, they changed the whole survey of the CPR, and it went south rather than come up through Yorkton, uh, Saskatoon, and North Battle and Edmonton on to the coast. The consequence was the development started south. The south had all the members. The south had all the influence. The south got all the immigrants. The country was opened up. They got the roads. They got the villages. They got everything started. We were had a standstill up north for 30 or 40 years until the growth got up to us. And it only got here about 10 or 12 years ago since that North Battle has been developing faster, faster, than any other city of its size in Western Canada. It was a much better route to follow for a railway than the southern route. Uh, if, if yes, I would think so, because it has split the, the three provinces right through and through, and then we could build transportation yes. lines on each side, and the development would have been doubled what it was. And actually, there's more Saskatchewan north of North Battleford than there is south. Yes, yes. actually, the, the, the center of Saskatchewan north and south is 25 miles out of here at Miota. Yes. Um, how long were you here before the uh, development of the Hudson Bay route uh, got your interest? Well, I was a member of the old Bay route uh, from when I came west in 1911. Seems, uh, it seems to me I was in the west when, the, when uh, a deputation of farmers went from, from the west. No, I was in Perth, if I remember correctly, because I was living in Perth when one Sunday mo morning a tap came to my door in the hotel where I was uh, where I where I was boarding, and I asked who was at the door, and he said, you "Open the door and you'll see." So I opened the, opened the door, and who was it but uh, Lahey Cameron from near Toronto, who had come to Ottawa with the uh, an eastern and a western delegation on farmers' rights. And it seems to me the old Hudson, the old Hudson, the old, the old uh, on to the Bay route was in existence before I came west. Anyway, I, I became a member of it in the west and was a member of it up, up to the time when the First World War took place and Churchill was Churchill uh, practically closed to business for security purposes. And then became when it was started in 1945 uh, or 44 again. I was still a member, and since that time, I've been uh, I've been uh, director of the Hudson Bay Company. I've done my best to get Churchill, one of the most build up Churchill, and make it one of the most important harbors, freshwater harbors in Canada.
The work is going forward splendidly, and the six million dollar contract will be completed next year when a hundred feet of you are. Well, 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 the operation. The Dow de Leash and the Wolf Wars were opened by representatives of that firm in Churchill. Good. Well, Mr. Mac We're running out of tape here, but we want to get uh, you into the House of Commons, so we'll move on to the 1925. Uh, you might tell us a bit about your nominating convention and your election that year. Our, uh, my first convention was held in 1925. Uh, it is a three-cornered convention. It was held in North Battleford. Rather big convention between 160 and 180 delegates from the city and, and, and the North Country. In that uh, convention, which I said was a three cornered one, <coughs> I won the nomination on the, uh, on the second ballot and went into uh, the election and was elected, if I remember now, corrected by about 1,500. Oh, yes. We were only down in Ottawa. We, the election was held in 1926. The session was called after Christmas. We went out to Ottawa. We found out that the parties, Bain parties in the House, were very close, to, very, close, very close in the way of representation. And it, it is just a question of how long the King government should could stand. It stood for a body, stood for a few months. And uh, the Prime Minister King asked Governor General Bing for a dissolution. The governor refused. The King resigned. And he called on Honorable Arthur Meehan to form a government. Honorable Arthur Meehan responded. He formed a government, but uh, it was called the shadow government, and it only lasted a few weeks. And, of course, Parliament dissolved. And we were into another election in 1926, and in that election, uh, King went to the country as, as, as a uh, fighting party man from the standpoint of Canada, from the standpoint of, of the Dominion. He put Bing in, he, he put Bing in the opposite uh, category of standing for uh, the motherland and standing for a type of government in a way colonial. The election was fought on practically a Canadian issue of that type. And, of course, it was one of these elections that King ever had. He went back with a big majority. Yes, it was against the Canadian tradition to yeah. have the Queen's representative yeah. refuse to take the advice yeah. of the Prime Minister of the yeah. Canadian. It was a good issue, all right. Yeah. Well, you would know uh, quite a number of uh, well-known people in Canadian history. Uh, Mr. Uh, King would be, who would be in his cabinet? Uh, all the honorable Ernest Lapointe was in his cabinet. Ian Mackenzie? Ian Mackenzie was in his cabinet. And uh, I just now... Chubby Powers, Chubby Powers would be there. Yes, yeah, Chubby there Powers there. was in his cabinet in, in, his, in his government. Yeah. And he, re re he was in two or three of the 40 folios in the time that he was, uh, the king government was in existence. Yes. You just mentioned at supper time, uh, running across of one of your... Uh, uh, colleagues of previous days, uh, Mr. Ward from Dauphin, and uh, I'm under, I wonder if you'd be good enough to repeat uh, uh, the uh, yes. information about Churchill versus Nelson. Bill Ward was the member for uh, for uh, Dauphin in northern Manitoba, and he had moved out from Gray County to Manitoba before I came west. He was born in the same township in Gray County as myself, Sullivan Township. And uh, it was a stony farm. His father died. He was born in Old Sound. And he made up his mind that he would come west. He told his, he told his mother that the quicker to done, the better. And so they decided to come west and locate it in Dauphin. Later, he, he took part in, in the affairs of, in the Dauphin district at, and became member in 1921, he was down in Ottawa before I went down there four years. And he was a very good member for Western Canada. 
And Mr. Ward told me recently, when I attended the uh, Hudson Bay Root As Association Convention in Dolphin just a few months ago in June, that uh, a shipload of wheat was sent in by train to Nelson, where they thought we could make a harbor for Western Canada, where they built a steel bridge and started to build a wharf. The shipment of wheat that went in by tra tra train had to be taken out, put into small boats. The small boats had to take the wheat across to the big to the big uh, freighter in order to get out of the harbor. The freighter couldn't couldn't get in to the harbor at all. Mr. Ward saw what happened. And he came away with a conviction that, that uh, Nelson should never be the terminus of the railway, that the railway would have to go north. And he said that any money, any public money put into Nelson w would just be lost. He went out with that conviction, and with the rest of us in 1926 and 1927, <coughs> decided that that the cr the quicker this matter of where this railway and this uh, and this port was to be, be the, the sooner it was settled, the better. So, Honorable Mr. Ch Honorable Charles Dunning had taken over the railway portfolio from Honorable George P. Graham, and a group of us went and interviewed uh, Mr. Dunning, and we decided then so that something should be done. Mr. Dunning got uh, a, a, a harbor export by the name of Palmer out from London. He made an investigation of the two ports. He presented his report to Parliament. His evidence and uh, recommendations were entirely in favor of Churchill and against Nelson. And the consequence was the railway was ch changed, put into Nelson in 1929, and in 1931 the first shipment of wheat took place out of Churchill. Well, Mr. Uh, Mackintosh, as you know, I was a member for Mackenzie for a number of years and was very enthusiastic about this route, too, and I certainly am personally greatly indebted to you and Billy Ward for making this bit of history available. I, I wasn't aware of the fact that any grain did move out of Nelson, and this is a fine service that you and Mr. Ward have performed. Well, Mr. Mackintosh, we haven't much uh, tape left, uh, uh, but... Uh, one of the subjects that received a good deal of your attention in Parliament was the question of a distinctive Canadian flag. Would you make a few comments about this topic? Uh, yes, Mr. Nicholson. Uh, I was only in Ottawa a year or two when I took up the issue of a, Canadi of a distinctive Canadian flag. I got the thought when I was going to... to uh, the uh, collegiate in my own county, in my own county. Uh, I thought from boyhood we should have a national flag, a, a, a distinctive Canadian flag. <coughs> I knew the history of my own country. I knew how we had to go out and fight for our liberty and our freedom in, in 1837 to get responsible government. I knew how we defended the country. Colonialism was passing away, and I thought it was about time we should have a flag of our own. So I brought in a resolution. As I said before, it was talked, as I said, or as I'd like to say, it was talked out on some occasions, and in other cases, it, it was dro dropped before it came up for discussion. But however, there was nothing done after me re introducing the resolution for year after year. There was practically nothing done on it until Mr. King appointed a commi committee later. The committee was a large and representative one, and it studied the matter for two years. And they brought in a report, a minority and a majority report. On account of having two reports, Mr. King, rather than putting the matter before Parliament and getting it settled, whether it should be the flag of the majority report or the flag of the minority report, he goes to work and puts through an order and council for the Red Ensign. And from then on, the red end sign has been flown on uh, the uh, public buildings of the provinces and uh, of the Dominion. I might say, uh, Mr. Nicholson, that how this red end sign came to be uh, came, came to be changed was this: under Sir John A. Macdonald, the, the fact of Canada was the red end sign.